Well, good afternoon. Uh, today we are in the fourth chapter of Esther, and last week when we left uh, our reading, we found that uh, the bad guys were drinking and laughing it up, and people in the city in Susa were questioning what kind of an evil edict had just been ordered to annihilate all of the Jewish people, and so we sort of had this grim uh, setting here uh, historically, and again, this is not outside of the character of um, Xerxes uh, as a really a madman, tyrant leader. Uh, this is not something that uh, falls outside of the scope of what we know historically to be true of him. And Haman, uh, who uh, the Amalekites, uh, who had this lengthy history with the Israelites, uh, the tribe of Benjamin in particular, and uh, we find that Mordecai Esther, uh, hailing from the tribe of Benjamin, uh, we find that that historical conflict has been brought forward now to a foreign land. And so that is what has taken place, and uh, it's really disturbing again, and I know that we're all familiar with the story, we know how the story is going to end, but I always like to pause and just think about what I would have been thinking in this moment. I mean, this is an entire group of people, an entire race of people that are going to be annihilated if intervention by God doesn't occur. And it's astounding how much depravity, how much hatred there is in the world, and how that boils over uh, so often uh, in our world. Uh, hatred is not something that remains uh, inward. It, it, it expresses itself outwardly. And so that's something that we always have to be guarding against. As Christians, am I allowing bitterness to settle in my heart? Am I allowing bigotry, any other sort of hatred? Um, am I allowing the past to dictate how I feel about somebody today? Uh, those are questions that we need to wrestle with. But as we uh, bring this narrative forward, uh, we're going to find what our chapter uh, in our study describes as Esther's uh, resolve, which I think is sort of a positive way to frame that. Um, she does get there, but uh, it doesn't begin that nice and neat. We're going to find that Esther has a lot of concerns, and she wrestles with what she's supposed to do. Uh, before coming to a, a point of decision, and even leadership. Uh, we're going to find that uh, throughout this book to this point, really everything that has happened has happened to Esther. Um, we have no indication that she has been the sole driving uh, decision maker in her own life. Mordecai has a significant influence, and uh, but we're going to find in the fourth chapter that she's really going to take control of the narrative, and that's going to be very important, but it, it takes a little bit to get to that point. And again, I think it's important to remember just what sort of context she's living in. In the first chapter, we found that Xerxes was an abusive man. He was abusive in a number of ways. Uh, he was willing to exploit, to physically uh, have his wife, Vashti, the queen, stripped down in front of foreigners just to show uh, how powerful and mighty he was. Uh, this is really a disturbing time, and when she resisted, uh, there was an edict that went out through the whole land uh, reminding women uh, of their place uh, in this in this context. And I say that, of course, um, with moral judgment upon it. I, I don't say that as like uh, some sort of endorsement of, of that worldview, but what they as a culture viewed as the woman's quote-unquote place, they make sure that they put a firm foot down on. And so there's a lot of disturbing facts about this culture, and Esther now, knowing that she's hated more than ever because of her nationality, now all of a sudden this sort of gets dropped on her lap, like, hey, what are you going to do to deliver us? Um, this would be really a tough place to be, and, and that's where she was. Uh, now, the events that are going to take place here in the fourth chapter are about five years after Esther has been made queen. And so there's been a little bit of a, of a time gap uh, between uh, Mordecai uncovering the conspiracy and what has taken place here. So uh, when Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, fasting, weeping, and wailing, many lay in sackcloth and ashes. 
When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned uh, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So he went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Notably, by the way, uh, Xerxes did not accept that fee, if, if you might remember. Uh, he actually declined it. He's basically willing to destroy the Jews for free. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And she... And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Uh, Hathak, this is the eunuch, went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has what but one law that they be put to death unless the king extends the golden scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go into the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go, gather together all the Jews who are, who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, nights, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So there's that resolve we're talking about. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Now contextually here, there's a few notes. Uh, one, we have this edict. Uh, where Esther is aware that neither man nor woman, and she's not uh, an exemption to this rule, is able to just bring themselves into the king's presence. Um, to do so could invite the wrath of the king, if he doesn't extend the golden scepter, and they will perish. Now, you would think that if the king were a good king, were of sound mind and judgment, that this would really be a no-brainer. You would like to think that if the queen wants to see the king... He's going to let her into the temple court. But remember his character. Remember that this is a mad man. For that reason, uh, there is significant concern that even though Esther appears to still have the king of the favor, there is no certainty about the way that he's going to be feeling or the way he's going to act on that day. Unsound leadership uh, always leads to uncertainty and fear and chaos. And that is what is transpiring here. Also, it's notable that Esther is not speaking to Mordecai individually. Uh, she uh, is uh, kept away from everybody. Uh, the queen, the concubines, uh, they are isolated. Uh, she belongs to the king. And uh, she is not simply free to go anywhere that she would like uh, let alone into the presence of the temple court. Uh, I'm sorry, of the, I keep saying temple court, I'm so used to preaching that way, uh, into the uh, the court of the king. Well, uh, on, but in addition to that, it's kind of interesting, in our day of technology, where I can record a video and you can watch it from your homes, uh, you could text me, we could actually do video calls if we'd like. Uh, here, of course, there's no cell phones, no technology, uh, you have to have this poor eunuch running back and forth, forth repeating these messages, uh, making sure he gets them right. And so he's really caught in the midst of this discussion. Um, I don't think that's a job I would want, especially with the details of this. Uh, that sort of makes you a party to their plan. But uh, nevertheless, that's where he found himself, uh, that eunuch. Well, uh, beginning this chapter and kind of looking at some notes here and some things that are book referenced or study guide, but other things I'm going to wade into, it says, when Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. Uh, this would have been something that the Assyrians would have recognized as well. They had, in their cultural customs, uh, this idea of grieving by uh, tearing your clothes and, 
and uh, putting on sackcloth and, and wearing ashes. And so this is not something that would have been seen as necessarily strange. Uh, but it's interesting that throughout this book to this point, Mordecai has done the best he could to disguise his nationality. He has done everything he can to make sure that Esther is not known to be a Jew. But here he's willing to enter the public spaces with the acknowledgement that he's a Jewish person and that his life's at risk and that he's weeping over that. Now, there is more than just weeping for physical death here. The picture that is presented is actually one of repentance. Now, as I've said uh, throughout our study here, we don't know Mordecai's heart, and so I want to be careful with how I tread on this topic, but the evidence that we have presented to us suggests that Mordecai was not a faithful Jewish man. The evidence seems to suggest that he was more interested in political power than being devout. He was more interested in remaining in a place where he was comfortable than, for instance, returning back uh, to Israel. And he's more interested in his own physical safety. He doesn't want anybody to know he, who he is. He doesn't want his ability to climb the uh, political ladder or to benefit from uh, Esther's position of power to be hindered by people discovering who their people are. That all comes to a head here. The situation comes crashing down the world that he thought he had. Remember, to this point, his trajectory is great. He went from having a job to having a position. He went from having a position to receiving the king's uh, favor. Uh, now, that has not been returned yet, but he was somebody who uncovered a conspiracy to take the king's life. He has access to the queen, who is his uh, niece, and he's able to really uh, exude a lot of influence over her at this point. So he's a man who has increasing power and influence in the king's court. And here, uh, believing that he has control over his life, he is reminded instantly that nobody has control over their lives. There is nothing that he could possibly do to ensure his safety. He can hope that God is going to intervene through Esther's work. First, that Esther is going to be willing to go along with this plan. Second, that the king is not going to just kill her on the spot, that he'll actually listen to her. Third, that he's actually going to do as she asks. And uh, fourth, that he is going to be delivered, he and all of his people. He realizes here the frailty of his life and the fact that uh, what appears to be proud actions are humbled. Now, there are multiple ways that we can respond to that. Some people, when their world comes crashing down, they become bitter at God, and they turn to anything and everything else, and they reject God. Other people, uh, their hearts are softened, and they respond in saving faith. Mordecai, it appears, from what we have throughout the rest of the text, responds uh, in the latter way. He responds in faith, believing that God is able to deliver. That doesn't mean that all of his methods are going to change. We're going to look at that in just a moment. But... What we're going to find is that there's real repentance. Um, moving forward here, we're going to find, as I said, uh, his, his uh, actions don't always change. Um, he speaks to the eunuch, and he indicates the fact that, uh, you know, the, that Haman had offered to pay, or he, he did pay, uh, so much amount to have the... Uh, Jews annihilated, but he leaves out the fact that the king didn't accept that, which I think, uh, as I read that, I would think would tend to, to speak to Esther that the king is on board 100% here, or the king was bribed, rather, that maybe he's a little bit more sensitive uh, to the concerns of the Jews than he really is. Because, again, uh, Xerxes, I don't need your money. Let's just wipe him out. That was his response. Let's do it. Uh, he doesn't need the money. So I, I, I don't think Mordecai wants her to think about it like that because, you know, what would be the motivation for going to see him uh, if you knew that? Um, so Mordecai conveniently leaves that out. Maybe we'll say he, he somehow forgets that fact or, or it's unknown to him somehow, uh, even though he knows the exact amount, indicating perhaps he knows the details. Uh, but then it, it appears as though he, he sort of blackmails Esther. There's some dark overtones to what he says. He's like, hey, um, it's going to work out for us. But if it doesn't, don't think you're going to get away with this. Don't think that you're going to be safe just because you're in the king's house. Um, what he's saying there, it, it appears, is 
you think you're safe because people don't know who you are, but we could fix that. We could we could let that leak. People could know that you're Jewish, and 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 then when they come for us, they're going to come for you also. That's the tone of what's being shared here. And so at first, Esther pushes back. She doesn't want to put herself at risk. Would you? She is fearful. Wouldn't you be? She is probably getting worn down of being told what to do. She's the queen. Here's Mordecai commanding her. This is what you're going to do. To this point in the, in the book, that's the way her whole life has gone. He dictates, she does. Here, she pushes back. And that brings us to the 14th verse. Mordecai had shared through the eunuch negative remarks. Why you should? Why Esther should go along? Why? Because it's not going to end well for you. Because everybody's at risk. Uh, those sorts of things. But here he frames it positively. He says, and who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. In some translation, who knows whether thou hasn't come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Think about what is conveyed. That's probably the most famous passage, famous line in this book. And for good reason. It's an open-ended question. And it implies here more than just uh, some sort of karma or, or just circumstance. That's not what he's appealing to here. Again, this is a man who has repented. He's repented, and we don't know exactly everything from what, but it appears as though he lacked faith. And here he's repented and turned towards God, weeping, even going, being willing to publicly identify as being Jewish, as being one of God's covenant people. And here... Uh, this conveys the tones that God, who is sovereign over human history, is in control. And everything that's happened in Esther's life, it wasn't contingent on her physical beauty. It wasn't uh, based on luck or circumstance. It was based on God's hand of providence over her life. There's a real purpose. There is something that God desires to do through her life. And I, and I think that this line is so well known uh, because... That question is still open-ended to us today. We don't get to choose our circumstances in life so often. Many things happen to us, not always by us. And uh, we didn't get to choose the timeline in which we lived, our families, uh, the communities in which we were born, uh, you know, those sorts of things, the physical gifts and, and limitations that we have and in many cases. Um, we can't pick those things. But what we can do is we can understand that God has called us to a mission, and he has given us everything that we need to accomplish it. Now, no person's mission looks exactly the same as somebody else's. Nobody's gifts are uh, perfectly identical, and I'm going to preach on that this Sunday with spiritual gifts, uh, and our circumstances are different. And some people have, a, it appears from the outside looking in, a relatively easy path, and some people have an incredibly difficult path, and every thing they try to do seems to be met with resistance. Many of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are, are persecuted for their faith, and, and that's something that many Christians here take for granted. I mean, here is in the West. Uh, but so, so this is an open-ended question that we still wrestle with. Uh, God, what have you called me to do? Lord, you called me here. We don't view the timeline in which we live, well, woe am I, because I live right now, and things are tough, and they're difficult, and there's a lot of arguments, and there's a lot of uh, divisiveness in our nation, and there's a lot of hurt and, and turmoil. I wish I wasn't born now. No, as Christians, we say, Lord, you called me here. You have a mission for me right now. You appointed me to live now, and there's a reason for that. So what is that mission? Lord, I want to be found faithful. I, I'm not a prisoner of my circumstances. I'm somebody through which you are you are causing your gospel message to go forward. Uh, not because of me, but because of you. And so that, that's sort of what's conveyed here uh, from, from Mordecai to Esther and again to us. And, and so uh, this question goes forth, and it works. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa. She takes command. She doesn't say... I'm going to do exactly what you want, when you want. She says, this is what we're going to do. And for the first time, we find Esther taking this sort of a lead, and her lead isn't political. The lead that she takes is spiritual. 
She commands that everybody fast for her for three days. Now, when they fasted, she's not saying just, you know, stop eating uh, hamburgers for a couple of days because that's what you like to eat, whatever it might be. Um, this isn't just like a, a Lent type of fast, okay? This is them. Now, again, Lent, I can say positively. I'm not trying to put that down. I'm saying, but she's saying you're going to, you're going to fast. And you are going to pray. That That is contained here in this, and it doesn't say the word prayer. It doesn't have to. Uh, we know the historical setting and what that means uh, to the Jewish people to fast. They're going to pray. They're going to pray diligently for her, for them, for the situation. They're going to go before God on her behalf. They're going to intercede on her behalf. It is so important that God's people come together. That they recognize when they're in danger when circumstances are overwhelming, when the times in which they live are pressing, when they're discouraged, but they come together as a body, not as lone wolf Christians, but they come together as a body to glorify Jesus Christ and to pray and to lift one another up and to encourage. And that's exactly what we find the Jewish people doing here. And so Mordecai now, on behalf of what King Queen, what Queen Esther has, charged, has commanded him to do, he carried out all of Esther's instructions. And that's going to bring us to the fifth chapter. Next week, we're going to look at Esther's request coming before the king. But I'd like you to be thinking through a few thoughts of this. When calamity strikes, how will you respond? Will you respond to God? Will you respond against him? Um, as you look at your life, do you find yourself uh, willing to be in identification with the Lord? Willing to let everybody know that you love Jesus? Um, are you somebody who understands that the situation in which you find yourself, the historical context in which we live, that you're not a prisoner to it, you're not a slave to it. It doesn't have victory over you. Do you understand that God has called you here for a specific purpose? And do you know what that purpose is? I'd love to talk with you more on that point. If you have any questions or thoughts, always feel free to reach out to me. As I shared last week, I'm still uh, taking uh, requests for the next topic or book of the Bible uh, we discuss. So please reach out to me if you have any input. But otherwise, uh, we will record next week's video next Wednesday and get that out to you. May the Lord bless you. Mm -hmm.